Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It's Monday, June 16th, 2014. And Lou Rockwell joins us once again today to talk about his new book, Against the State, an anarcho-capitalist manifesto. There's so much more to talk about and really never a shortage of things to discuss with Lou. Most of you know Lou. Of course, he runs LouRockwell.com, the indispensable website. He, of course, served as Ron Paul's chief of staff all those years ago. And he is the founder and chairman of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot org, is that website. And by the way, let me remind everybody, if you weren't subscribed to this program and you weren't automatically getting it on your iPod through iTunes or Stitcher or anywhere else, you might have missed this episode. You would never be able to forgive yourself. So make sure you subscribe. You'll get a brand new commute size program Monday through Friday. You can easily subscribe over at TomWoodsRadio.com. Of course, it's free, and you'll enjoy it. It's fun, interesting guests, great conversations. Lou Rockwell, welcome back to the show. Tom, great to be with you. This book, Against the State, is getting plaudits from everybody. So Charles Goyette likes it. Ron Paul likes it. I like it. People, everybody who reads it seems to be thrilled with it. It's readable in the sense that it's got interesting, compelling, punchy prose. It's got it's packed with information, and it's short enough that the length of it is not daunting. It doesn't put people off. And you know, by the way, length of books does not always put people off. It amazes me how many people read The Creature from Jekyll Island. It amazes G. Edward Griffin how many people read that book. But all the more will read a book of this length. I'm really pleased about it. So I want to continue our conversation because we we peeled away only a few layers of the onion last time. And I want to start off with a concept that we talked about on this program just a couple weeks ago in connection with Teddy Roosevelt. We had the author of a little book called American Fascist talking about Teddy Roosevelt, and I wanted to give him a chance to show that his use of the word fascism was not just hyperbole, that even though we're not necessarily talking about Hitler himself, there are ideas in fascism that are present to a greater or lesser extent in various regimes. What are you talking about when you say American fascism? What do you have in mind? Well, of course, as as your your, uh, you and your interviewer, interviewee, I should say, pointed out, um, Fascism comes from the Progressive Era. It's not a coincidence that uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, came to power in that time, and this is when Mussolini developed his ideas. This is before Hitler. So fascism antedates Hitler, and it's not just an epithet. I mean, it, it is an actual, uh, um, maybe not a very systematic, but it's, it's definitely a, 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 an ideological system, a political system, and an economic system. Um, Mussolini himself said, really, it's better described as corporatism than fascism because it represented the melding of state power and corporate power, of course, under the, uh, under the politicians and applied against everybody else in society. So what is fascism? And I, I think the American system, we uh, certainly, Teddy Roosevelt uh, had his fascist impulses. Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal was entirely fascist. I mean, it really was ripped off from Mussolini and uh, uh, it was a, it was a, um, a, it benefited the big companies that were in cahoots with the federal government, hurt all the companies and the consumers and everybody else who was not in cahoots, and it it uh, set out to change American capitalism, and they and they didn't do it. So um, now I would say there's been many many advances in fascism. Uh, it doesn't the fact that we don't have death camps is not a refutation. Uh, that the, the American political and economic system is not fascist. So it, it's it's the corporate state. It's a uh, combination of the welfare state, um, uh, of massive regulation of business, of uh, hatred of the other. In our case, maybe it's Muslims, uh, you know, Islamists and so forth, who uh, allegedly justify uh, total surveillance and total control of the American population. Uh, it's 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 government that, in Mussolini's case, it was the labor unions, big business, and government in, in a in a combine. Thank goodness, in our own country, the labor unions are not a significant force anymore, and are becoming less and less. But nevertheless, we have big corporations, 
big government cooperating together against the rest of us. It also involved militarism. I mean, all the, the what, what I think, what unfortunately, most people accept is just the norm, the worship of the police and the military and, mm. the, you know, the so-called first responders, that's entirely a fascist impulse. The idea that we're supposed to think that these are higher-level beings, they're far more, far better and more significant people than just regular, the, what uh, Will Greek calls the mundanes, uh, that it should be, and it's perfectly plausible and really moral, that it's a far more serious crime to, say, touch your elbow to a cop who's arresting you, and therefore you're resisting arrest, and it would ever be, it, touch a regular person with, you, with your elbow by mistake. So it's, it's, uh, it's the glorification, it's the constant warfare system, uh, the constant wars going on everywhere. Mussolini, Hitler, Teddy Roosevelt all believe that war was, uh, in some sense, the, the highest uh, result of civilization, that this was what not only was the flowering of civilization war, but that advanced civilization, well, you know, it advances something. It's not, not of course, uh, civilization. So the constant wars, the constant militarism, uh, military worship, and uh, planning by the government and the big corporations of all of economic life. And then we have the total surveillance state, and uh, uh, we have, unfortunately, what is what is still, uh, as compared to some other regimes, a soft fascism, but it's becoming uh, increasingly hard, and it's not, you know, it's, it's, uh, slightly, it's more than slightly alarming. On the other hand, I think there's uh, more and more, especially young people, are becoming awakened to what the American system is, what it's become, the, what their own, how their own lives are being stunted by it, their own economic possibilities in the future. And uh, I think there's a lot of, Ron Paul, of course, is the major factor in this. All the ideas of the great libertarians and Austrians, uh, Murray Rothbard and everybody else, of course, the foundation for all of this. But Ron, uh, by all his work, has awakened young people, not only in this country, but all around the world, as to the, the importance of freedom, how it's being attacked, and um, why we don't want a corporate state, a fascist state, why it goes against every value of decency and religion and uh, the golden rule, and uh, it just is, is uh, an attack on, of course, private property, which is the real basis of civilization, so of course, not war. Uh, so that while the government, we don't actually have, for the most part, government ownership of the means of production, that is, a, you have the TVA, you have, you know, the, the VA, single-payer socialist medical system. I mean, there are some aspects of, of the American economy that are classically socialist, but mostly um, private ownership remains in the hands of, of the private sector. Control is increasingly in the hands of the government, so that whatever government agency we look at, whether it's the EPA or the IRS or, or uh, OSHA or the, the Treasury Department, the Interior Department, all of them uh, are massively increasing in power. And business people today have to worry first and foremost not what their customers are thinking and might want, but what is the government thinking, what might the government do to them. And so they, they spend vast resources, vast amounts of time that should go into new products and services to attract the consumer and satisfy consumer wants, go into worrying about the government. And um, I, 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 Hans Hoppe read, me, met recently with, I, I won't name him, but a, an important billionaire who's interested in, in Hans's ideas. And he had a lot of the businessmen associated with him. And Hans said all of them were terrified of the government. I mean, they were very, very concerned um, about what might happen to them, for example, if they spoke out. And uh, I think this is what's this is the kind of country that we've developed. It's a it, it is a fascist system. On the other hand, it's it's uh, sort of the glorification of falsehood, uh, so that there's and we do have the truth on our side. So that's of course extremely extremely important. And I think I actually think the future can be bright just because of young people uh, resisting the system. They don't like the surveillance. They don't like the wars. Uh, they really, really, Paulianism is is, uh, is spreading. Also, the ideas of anarcho-capitalism are spreading. And I think that uh, all the attacks on it, there have been more attacks on, on uh, private property anarchism 
uh, libertarian anarchism, however Murray Rothbard called it anarcho-capitalism. Um, uh, more attacks on this philosophy than I think has ever, certainly in my lifetime, I've ever seen. See, the media, whether it's the New York Times or down to Salon or up from Salon or whatever, uh, many of New Republic, many of these Many of these publications and uh, intellectuals, uh, public intellectuals, are attacking our ideas. So if they didn't worry about us, of course, they wouldn't bother to attack. So they are worried about it. They're worried about its appeal to young people. They're worried about the fact that young people, and Ron Paul made it possible for conservatives to be anti-war. Everybody had been brainwashed from the time of Bill Buckley, that uh, if you weren't pro-war, you were you were uh, pro-communist. You were, you know, just the worst kind of bad guy, and had to be at war everywhere all the time. And that's that's the right way. No, it's not. Of course, it's not the right way. It's obviously not the right way. War is, uh, I would argue, nothing but mass murder, and um, it's not a good idea. We're thank goodness most of us are not equipped to go kill people. It's why veterans don't ever want to talk about what happened. Whatever, whatever happened, to, what happened to them? They don't want to talk about what they were forced to do, what they saw. It's so horrifying, and it affects them as badly for the rest of their lives. That's why we see so many suicides among veterans, suicides among troops, and then of course there's all the people who are being killed. We're we're only supposed to worry about American casualties. Uh, for example, I saw something uh, on Drudge the other day talking about, you know, what was Iraq worth it. 48, uh, uh, sorry, I don't have the figures exactly, but something like 4,800 Americans killed, 68,000 wounded. But of course, there probably have been a million people killed in Iraq. Uh, the British Medical Journal Lancet had a very, very good study of this. This is some years ago. You know, it's certainly hundreds and hundreds of thousands of innocents, um, people with their arms and legs blown off among the ones who were still surviving, everybody's home, people's homes destroyed, businesses destroyed. Um, and now, of course, in Iraq, we see the uh, uh, the alleged Al Qaeda taking over, and and uh, hilariously, the Iraqi army just taking their uniforms off and, and getting out. They don't uh, they don't want to kill. They don't want to be killed. So um, many many interesting things happening in the world. The state is actually having trouble. They believe, of course, that everything can be solved by the gun at the head all that takes care of everything if they have the power to put a gun to your head that will just solve everything but of course it doesn't solve everything even for the even for the state they require people's active consent or at least tacit consent for what they're doing that consent i would argue is evaporating especially among young people they're worried about the ideas of freedom and um so i i think as, as murray pointed out all throughout human history, there's been the struggle between power and market. This is nothing new. It's a, it's a struggle that would never be won uh, the side of heaven, I'm afraid. But certainly we can make progress. We can, we can reduce the amount of evil in the world. Uh, and the, the state, I would argue, is you know, mankind's greatest earthly enemy. Obviously, there are spiritual enemies that are more important, but from a standpoint of a human enemies, it's the state. And uh, uh, so I think there's uh, I think there's every reason to be to be uh, look forward to the future because of young people and also some of us older people are waking up too to what's been done. Uh, Fred Reed had a wonderful column the other day about about uh, how many veterans are waking up to the fact that they were used that it's not they weren't actually uh, you know serving the country protecting freedom and all the rest of the lies that are told. But they were they were misused, and uh, they were misused for terrible and evil things. So I think people are waking up. Uh, Internet continues to be very important as much as the government uh, is trying to restrict it. And people are reading, people are learning. I think uh, I think libertarianism is spreading, uh, and I think it's it worries the bad guys, and that's a good thing because they should be worried. You know, Lou, I had Bob Higgs on some months ago on the program, and he's an example of somebody whose thought really did evolve over the years. He was always a limited government libertarian. But then, because I asked him, I said, you've, you've obviously really radicalized over the past five to ten years. What happened? And he said that it finally hit him. And I might add parenthetically, it's very, very rare for an academic 
to really huh. have second thoughts about anything, right? You just yeah. double down for your whole career. But he said that he, as he was doing scholarly work that uh, in the field of economics and sometimes economic history, he was describing the state in ways that he realized had no connection to reality at all. Like he was going along with the standard academic approach to the state, and he realized that this is not how the state is. These are not the state's motivations. These are not the this, the state is not composed of the sorts of people that the theorists uh, assume that it is. And so he's just abandoned it completely. And he's entirely a, a Rockwellian at, at this point, entirely a Rothbardian in his outlook. And his Facebook updates are some of the best parts of my day sometimes, <laughs> even though they can be depressing. On, on the military issue, sometimes. You know, you and I feel like we're making a lot of progress, and we, we certainly are, but one thing that deflates me is the ubiquity of the military worship. It is everywhere. It's in every sector of society. The military people get discounts on coffee. They get discounts on sandwiches. They get special consideration when they board a plane. And the even the progressives, the ones who are supposed to be anti-war, they'll lamely clap for them on the airplane. And look, I'm sorry, I'm just not clapping. I'm not. Cla- I mean, the and the conservatives, by the way, the conservatives will be against some regulatory agencies, and this regulatory agency is a bunch of of thugs, and we don't like these government employees. But this other branch of government employees can do no wrong. You got to stand up and salute. You got to applaud. They're sacrificing for our freedoms. These pieties are repeated even by people who ostensibly oppose the wars. Thanks for your service. What are you talking about? Am I living in an Orwell novel? Like, what can we do about this? You know, as Joe Sobern pointed out, he said conservatives are against government programs unless they involve killing people. Yeah. <laughs> so, of yeah. course, this is what the state specializes in. I mean, it, and in fact, um, I think people who are killers or who enjoy sending others to kill are attracted to the state. Maybe some, maybe they become hitmen for the mafia, but mostly they become politicians. And they actually enjoy starting wars. They enjoy having people killed. They they are, uh, you know, there are, there are some people who feel that people like FDR um, or Bob Dole, who, who are themselves uh, disabled, sometimes have a, a, an impulse. They don't mind sending strong young guys off to be mutilated. Uh, that they actually actually like it, so it's it's a uh, uh, it, it's a very it's very very unfortunate. The military worship is yes, I've I've never seen anything like it in my life. It's all America has always been a very militaristic, um, a very militaristic country. It's not true, for example, that veterans were spit upon when they came back from Vietnam. That's all just a lie. I can tell you, I was there for you know the the idea that that that, that hippies were uh, being, you know, being uh, uh, nasty to veterans who could beat them up. I mean, just believe me, it didn't happen. Even <laughs> then, the, the, the veterans were exempt and the troops were exempt from people always wanted to blame the government. Although if we look at, we listen to Ron Paul's favorite Andy War song, The Universal Soldier, you know, it couldn't happen without the soldiers. If the soldiers don't, if the soldiers refuse to kill, the whole war operation comes to a halt. Right. It doesn't matter a big, you know, Lockheed Martin or or the rest of these munitions manufacturers are. It doesn't matter how many people at the Pentagon, they need the soldiers. So, um, I, you know, when you see, good for Bo Bergdahl, uh, the guy who apparently uh, sought to change his job, or as they put it in uh, military speak, desert, um, and he didn't want to, he didn't want to kill anymore, and he didn't want to be part of, be part of the killing, and of course he didn't want to be killed either. Um, that's good that they term that cowardice, although it seems to me a perfectly perfectly a healthy and normal reaction. So there's a tremendous amount of, of propagandization that goes on. But the military training, in fact, as Fred Reed pointed this out, that consists largely in attempting to suppress the conscience. That's the job of the chaplains in the military to to suppress the conscience. To do, if we can think of sort of basic libertarian insight about about government. It's allowed to do everything that we know among ourselves in the private world are crimes. So that if, if uh, you know, the idea that, say, somebody is, let's say, an escaped criminal is hiding in somebody's apartment building, you can't just bomb the apartment building um, to get the guy. 
you can't call it collateral damage. You can't commit murder. Uh, it's murder is a crime, even if you're wearing a government uniform. So, you know, as mo- maybe we have a hope of at least some of these soldiers realizing that they're being sent out to commit crimes. And, of course, they come back with all these horrible uh, mental problems and, of course, all these, obviously physical problems a lot of times, too. And then we see the government promoting the hiring of veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan as police because they'll have the right attitude towards the, towards the people, which is, of course, not protect and serve, but to control. That's why they have, we see with the police having military, the militarization, the uniforms, the military uh, vehicles that they have, the military weapons, all designed against the people. So the, the state always fears its own people most. It doesn't actually fear the, the Ruskies or whoever is the, the uh, enemy of the moment. It always fears the people. It's why all the propaganda is aimed at us. And, of course, a lot of times, as in this military worship, it's successful. But America, I'm, I'm sorry to say, has always been a, a, a hotbed of military worship. It's one of the faults, one of, the faults of, our, of our country. Well, you know, Lou, on this, on this general subject, I know that in our society you don't win any popularity contest by saying that maybe, just maybe, the troops might bear some moral responsibility here. But Really, and, and and I do and I do understand that there's so much propaganda that it is possible that somebody could really not know, not understand the moral significance of what he's doing. But you know, that can go only so far. If you're going to sign up for a job that you know involves killing people, you know you got to at least crack open a book. You know, yeah, you got to look at the history of the area that you're going to bomb. You have some remote sense of what's what's going on there. I mean, I have people in distant relatives of mine who have been in the military who have not got the first clue about anything in the world other than the U.S. is great and rah, rah, rah. Now, you know, you mentioned the universal soldier. I, I'm sure you'll recall at Ron Paul's rally for the Republic in 2008, he had uh, Amy Allen sing that song because he has always... Uh, appreciated that song. And then in his own remarks, I was really moved by this. He said that he sometimes looked back on his own time as a flight surgeon in the military and asked himself, was I the universal soldier? That, you know, in in my own small way, I enabled this. Maybe I should have just said no to the whole thing. And again, how unusual is it for somebody in his 70s to look back and say, in public no less, Maybe I did something that was seriously wrong, and I look back on it, and I, I wish I could have done it over, had it to do over again. And this, by the way, a man who became a physician, so he would never be called upon to kill people for the government. It, right. Well, I was interested in many, and obviously he might have become another kind of scientist. Uh, he might have done many other things. He might have become a businessman, a successful businessman, too. But that's why he became a doctor. Yeah. Uh, so that was his motive. And of course, this comes about through introspection. I don't think you, I mean, it's, of course, it's very, obviously I'm from reading books, uh, your books, my book, uh, many of Rothbard. I mean, it's, it's, it's essential. But can we also just know from introspection, um, isn't this, you know, the Catholic doctrine of the natural law? Things are, certain things are written on the human heart by God. One of them is not a good thing to kill people. Yeah. Murder is a problem, and and uh, so it's you know it's it's why you know, these kids get brainwashed. A lot of times they're because of the Fed and other government economic policies. They don't have maybe a any kind of econ- economic future in the private economy, or that's what they feel. Yeah, and uh, so they join for that reason. And so if something is in your economic interest, of course, it's very easy to think it's it's okay. And uh, everybody is trained to believe that. Anybody who is resisting the U.S. is is, is a uh, undermentioned who deserves to be killed, deserves to have his throat slit, and that's true of his wife and children and his grandparents and so forth too. They all who are you know that they have, they made the mistake of as uh, Leonard Peikoff, the horrible guy who's Ayn, Ayn Rand's successor and head of the Ayn Rand Institute, said you can kill everybody in a and in a, in a, he was for 
nuking all Arabs, and I guess he still is, but he was arguing for this. And he was asked the question about, you know, what about non-combatants. He said they're living in that country, right. therefore they're responsible. Yeah, so he takes the leftist view that just by standing somewhere, you've consented to the regime. I mean, that's the, that's the old, that's the most totalitarian view of all. And also from some of these official Randians. Now, I don't want to get complaints from ordinary objectivists. I'm talking about the official mouthpieces of various objectivist organizations. We hear repeatedly the use of the term terrorist countries. Now, these are the same people who call themselves individualists, and yet they speak in this horrifying collective about terrorist countries. And then, as you say, repeatedly you see objectivist scholars saying that we should not worry for a moment about collateral damage. And yet this is the view that portrays itself as the philosophy of reason. Heaven help us. <laughs> no, no, of course it's, it's, it, it's true. And, and uh, if we're going to start to talk about terrorist countries, I don't think you're talking about the country, but sort of terrorist regimes, uh, why isn't the U.S. right at the top of the list? I mean, if we think of the, the U.S.'s official definition of terrorism, and by the way, it has to be non-state. We start right off by saying uh, that it's a non-state, it's a non-state thing, terrorism, and it's the use of uh, violence or the threat of violence against the civilian populations and civilian targets to attempt to bring about political change. Well, what's the U.S. doing in all its wars? I mean, that's you know, what are all the drones and so forth? And when they bomb a wedding party. They feel that they can just give the, you know, the, the, the survivors of the f- surviving families a couple thousand dollars, and that's, uh, you know, that's fine. And everybody's trained to think it doesn't matter. They're gooks. They're not, uh, they're not really humans. Uh, so it's a, it's a horrendous, it's, it's a horrendous, um, and the, the National Socialist didn't invent this, invent this sort of attitude. Um, maybe it's always been present in, in, uh, in the human heart. Along with it, some other bad things, but it's uh, it's, it's intensified. It to, it's intensified by the state. Well, this, the state, of course, uh, lives off of it. I mean, this this is this is the source of the state's power. Of that and the drive towards egalitarianism is, is is another one. But war, yes, it's. I mean, as, you know, as, as uh, famously said, war is the health of the state. War is sort of the foundation of the state. War is the essence of the state. And uh, I, I always find it interesting that there's so many troops in Washington D.C. that they're only allowed, they're ordered, in fact, that you may, you must, of course, wear your uniform on Tuesday, but not the other days of the week, because if all the soldiers and Marines and uh, Navy guys uh, and Air Force guys wore their uniforms every day, the place would look like an armed camp, and of course, it is an armed camp. And it's it's uh, engaged in what uh, Jack Douglas calls uh, the annihilation of nations. I mean, look what they've done to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we even hear rumors about a possible uh, uh, first strike using atomic weapons against Russia uh, to sort of eliminate them once and for all as, as one of the few countries that's actually challenging the U.S. desire to rule the globe and global domination. Uh, certainly many, many... Political leaders and dictators have been accused of wanting to rule the globe, and maybe they all do, but uh, very few of them have had the wherewithal. The U.S. government actually has the wherewithal and has pretty much achieved it, um, world domination, world rule, and I guess they want to rule the solar system and the universe, too. Uh, but they, the two countries that are giving them trouble are China and Russia, and uh, not obeying. So uh, there are people who... who uh, in the uh, evil Herman Kahn's neocon view, will think the unthinkable, that is, um, the sort of routine use of atomic weapons against civilian populations as a way to control opposition in other countries. So Bob Higgs is, has said in a tremendous uh, talk at the, to the Mises University last summer at uh, the Mises Institute, and you can see it online at Mises.org, uh, he talked about he thought the U.S. state was actually capable of exterminating life on Earth. I mean, they were actually so crazy as well as evil with all their, you know, just to take one aspect, in Fort Detrick, Maryland, is this vast government uh, enterprise, and there are others in other parts of the country, too. 
that exists only to create deadly diseases. To create, and, and there's a bunch of there's a bunch of government scientists right now who, who are engaging in attempting to restore the Spanish flu virus that came about as a result of World War One and that killed 50, 50 million people. That's sort of erased from from history and from people's memories because the whole thing was so unbelievably horrendous. In this country, too, by the way, um, uh, I had people from my family in those days died from this, too, and I think this was true of almost every American family. So uh, these scientists, funded by the government, are attempting to bring this virus back. Now, what? They, yeah, they claim, yeah, you know, yeah. only the government would do that. You can't imagine a, a, a private company doing that. This is the government. So they, they, they produce biological weapons. They produce chemical weapons. Uh, there have even been efforts to bring about uh, diseases and bacteria that would attack particular ethnic groups like Arabs. Or so it's, it's, I mean, they're really, I mean, e- Dr. Evil doesn't quite describe these people. Well, you know, Lou, early on, before they launched the war in Afghanistan, uh, we know that there was a slideshow that was shown to Condi Rice and Rumsfeld, and it was called Thinking Outside the Box, Poison the Food Supply. And this was just considered, you know, a possible policy option that they might consider. You know, if as as we've been talking, it's occurred to me that very often we hear people say, I, I believed in the free market, but the one issue where I just had trouble coming on board with you guys was foreign policy, was war. That was the last hurdle for me, and then when I finally saw it, then I joined with you guys. But isn't it funny – and that was true for me too, by the way – but isn't it funny that it should be that way, that we've been so bamboozled by the state that – the worst thing that it does is the thing that we have the most difficulty letting go of. Like, why shouldn't war be the first thing that we see is wrong, and then the minimum wage be the last one? Like, what, isn't it funny that it goes the other way? Yeah, it, it, it is funny. And I can remember one of the first acts of the, of the Bush regime when it, when it attacked Iraq uh, was to bomb and destroy every single waste treatment facility in the country. Right. In order to cause disease. In order to poi- in order to make sure that the water couldn't be pure, in order you know, and it's why, of course, long before there was a military attack, uh, baby food, medicine, all kinds of things were banned uh, from being exported to Iraq. So this is you know the the fabled sanctions, which are also evil, which are also violate the moral law, and if we think of another way to think of anarcho capitalism of libertarianism is the state and its employees are not above the moral law. The moral law applies to them just as much as it does to the rest of us. This is very difficult for people to accept. Even, even clergymen have a difficult time. In fact, some of the, some of the worst uh, defenders of, of the war system are the clergy, are some of the clergy. Oh, yeah. Uh, so and that's been are... true for a long time. Even, even the progressive social gospel clergy were so in favor of World War I, the rhetoric would shock you. No, it's true. Of course, they were they were all in favor of it, and um, they actually thought it would build the kingdom of God on earth. Rothbard writes a lot about this in his in his history of thought and otherwise. Uh, but they thought that uh, building the kingdom of God on earth could be done by the state, and the the most important and best thing the state did was to kill people. So that would bring the reign of God. Well, not not quite. Yeah. Uh, so it's the reign of the devil or something that they're that they're actually promoting. Well, Lou, we're going to have to run, but I want to urge people to check out Against the State, an anarcho-capitalist manifesto. I mean, it is, it's important, especially if you think you're not going to agree with it. It's important to engage with these ideas, because, you know, we have reached a point, I think, at which if you're not engaged in soul-searching, if you're not engaged in a radical rethinking of your views, then, as they say, you're not paying attention. So, Lou, as always, I thoroughly enjoy our time. The time flies by. We could do an episode a week, and we would not run out of stuff to talk about. And now I'm going to get emails saying, yeah, yeah, do that, do that. But thanks again, Lou. I really appreciate it. Tom, it's an honor to be on your show. All right, everybody, before I let you go, here's a, an announcement you probably were not expecting given how busy I'm always telling you I am, and I am really busy, but I actually think I'm going to release a book this year. 
<laughs> you probably think I've lost my mind because I'm always telling you I'm spending all my time doing homeschool courses for Ron Paul, ronpaulhomeschool.com. And it's that is true. I am spending an unbelievable amount of time preparing those courses. It's 180 videos per course, so, you know, that's a little bit busy. Uh, you get a little bit busy when you're working on a project like that. But I have a, a lot of stuff that I've been writing over the past few years that it's, you know, it's been in this source and that source or on my blog, where I actually think I do some of my best work just on my blog, where I'm writing in response to some critic of libertarianism. So I'm, I think I'm going to do a book largely of my replies to critics, because a lot of people enjoy reading those. And it won't just be that, but that'll be a big chunk of it. And I could use your help in coming up with a title. So hold that thought for a minute. But I want you to know that everybody who's a supporting listener of this program will, of course, get the book for nothing. Like th That is just a guarantee. Everybody who's supporting the show at supportinglisteners.com will get this book, in addition to all the other goodies you get, the transcripts, the discounts, the everything else. You'll also get this book. Basically, if you're supporting me, you're going to pretty much get everything I do. So those of you who, in particular, are at the higher levels of support, you're also going to be getting one or more or all of the Ron Paul Homeschool courses that I'm producing. There'll be four of them in total. Two of them will be ready to be uh, distributed to you guys uh, within the next month or so. So you guys will get those. And they're suitable for adults, by the way. I didn't teach them in such a way that an, in, that an adult would have his intelligence insulted by them. Like, you can benefit from these. I'm really, really pleased with how they came out. So that and all these other things that I do, if you're supporting me, you're going to get what I'm doing. So that includes this book. So everybody, every level of support will get this book. But I need help with a title. And I haven't often gotten very good suggestions, when I, but I'm going to pitch it out there anyway. What would make for a good title for what's going to be a, a collection of punchy writings in defense of liberty? It's got to be interesting and fun and compelling in some way. But don't email me your suggestions because I can't sort through it all. But go over on Facebook. I'm going to open up a thread on Facebook and just post what your suggestion is there. That would be really, really helpful to me. And if, if I take your suggestion, I will give you a lifetime subscription to libertyclassroom.com. So how do you do that? Go over to Facebook. Go to my page. Don't look for me as Tom Woods. My page on Facebook is Thomas E. Woods Jr. So go to Facebook.com slash Thomas E. Woods. Or while you're at TomWoodsRadio.com, just click on the Facebook widget. Click on Like. And then head over there and look for that thread, which will be up momentarily. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. My thanks to Lou Rockwell. We'll see you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show. 